Okay. So today we're going to talk about CSS selectors and pseudo selectors. So previously we learned about HTML and today we're going to dive into the more styling aspect of web design. So before we, oh, sorry. Before we get into the actual concepts, um, there's a few announcements that we want to make. So the first one is that the ad drop deadline is tomorrow. I believe that there's a $10 late fee, um, but I think like the deadline itself is officially tomorrow. So please use your enrollment code um, as it expires after tomorrow. Um, homework one is technically due right now. Uh, so you should have already completed it and turned it in via the portal. Um, please refrain from doing your homework last minute, um, especially if it's something that you might have trouble with. So you wanna like make sure you have enough time to like go to office hours and ask like a TA for help. Um, for Piazza, uh, check portal submission debugging on Piazza. We saw a few people um, email us or ask private questions on Piazza about like homework questions that they had, um, which is completely fine. And we would be trying our best to get all of those answered on time. Um, also on Piazza, you may have noticed that we sent out an announcement about Discord. So uh, from the feedback from like the first lecture, we realized that most of you guys wanted a Discord for the CCALs, so we made one. Um, so you can <clears throat> add yourself to that Discord right now and the link is on Piazza. Um, we actually, maybe it's not posted on Piazza left yet, but um, you can check it later for the post. Um, lastly, we also have OH and since we're using Discord now, we will, some of the TAs will be hosting their OH on Discord um, while others might stick to Zoom. So please like check to make sure like whichever platform the TA is using. Um, and if you have any logistical questions about the course, please email us instead of using Piazza as we wanna keep Piazza mainly for like course related assignments and announcements. And as always, um, you can give us anonymous feedback at wdd.io slash go slash feedback. And you can always add songs to our class playlist, which we'll usually play at the beginning of class at wdd.io slash go slash Spotify. Yeah, so moving on to the actual content of today's lecture, um, before we get into the CSS part, um, here's like an HTML cheat sheet that one of our former instructors, Aja, I think she created and it's really useful. So if you ever want to like refer to this cheat sheet, you can like note it down or like copy the slide over somewhere that you can refer to frequently. But basically this cheat sheet tells you kind of the general format of what an HTML file usually looks like, as well as some tips for like how to keep your HTML code like organized. Um, and then on the right side, there's some important and useful tags, um, such as like paragraphs, breaks, whatever. So you don't have to like straight up memorize all of these different tags. You can just refer to this cheat sheet or some like online resource that like tells you what the tags are for each of these components. But yeah, this is just a super useful resource for you guys. So, now that we've learned about HTML, how exactly do we organize our project workspace? Um, and just a side note, this may not apply to industry standards, but this is something that we would like you guys to stick to throughout this class. So you may have noticed from homework one that um, the zip file that we gave you had a certain directory structure. And so it might look like the one that you see on the slide here where you have an assets folder and inside the assets folder, you have images folder and then the images contains like individual image files. Um, you may also have a scripts folder where all the JavaScript files are located as well as the styles folder where all the CSS files are located. Um, so that's like the assets file and that just contains all the like supplementary um, like content that you wanna display on your website. And then here we have a folder called otters. <laughs> Um, so this is just like a subdirectory that you can create. Um, it can be named anything. It's up to you to decide um, how to organize like your sub pages. But sometimes you use these folders to just organize like other pages that you might have on your website um, just for better structure. 
And then as always, you have your index.html file inside the root of your directory. Um, this is really important because everything that is shown on the website starts from the index.html and you route everything such as your images, style sheets, whatever, from your index.html. So you wanna make sure that the entry HTML file is located in the root of your directory. So going to more specifics about the paths that you would use, um, like I mentioned, when you're coding in the index.html file, you wanna to refer to like images and style sheets and JavaScript files from like other places in your directory. So there's two ways to refer to those files. One is relative path and the other is absolute path. So the relative path is defined as the path to another file relative to the current file. So it may point to different files depending on the current location. Um, for example, like if you're in the if you're in a file that's in the otter file and you write a relative path, that will be different from if you write the exact same path in your index.html. Um, so here are some examples, assets slash images slash otter.jpg. Um, so that would tell you that you wanna go under the folder assets, which is located in the same level as you are right now. And then under images, there's an otter.jpg file. Um, I guess another way that you can specify uh, relative paths is using the dot slash. So that means that you're staying in the same directory. And then the last one is dot dot slash, which means you wanna go up a parent directory or go up to the parent directory. So for example, if you're within a subfolder and you wanna reach like the parent folder, like subfolder, you wanna go up a level and then go down to like assets. Um, so these are just like several ways you can like move up and down throughout the hierarchical structure of your directory. On the other hand, there is absolute path. So an absolute path is a complete path to another file. And since it's not relative, the absolute path is always pointing to the exact same file, no matter where you are in the file structure. Um, so for example, if you do slash, that means that you're taking it from like the root. So you wanna take the assets folder from the root directory. Um, another or other ways that you might use absolute paths is to specify like HTTPS colon slash slash. Um, and that's just like something that you'd usually see on a website. And then another one is file. So this one is not like on a remote server, this is like on your own computer. So if you wanna access a file that's like located in your users folder, like on your computer, this is the absolute path that you would use. Yeah, so again, we just want to kind of like visually show you guys what this looks like when you're like linking files within the index.html file. So here we have an image and the path is assets slash images slash otter.jpg. And so on the left side, you can see the file structure of what we have for a project. So currently we're in index.html and that's on the same level as otters and assets. And here we want to get the otter.jpg file. So that's located under assets and under images. So we use the relative path assets slash images slash otter.jpg. Yeah, so this is kind of like what it looks like. On the other hand, you might use the dot dot slash notation. So the dot dot slash tells you that you wanna move up a file. So instead of being in the index.html this time, we're in the otter-1.html file, which means if you wanna ask, if you wanna access the otter.jpg file, we need to like move up the file directory and then move down to otter.jpg. So that's why we need to use the dot dot slash notation. Yeah, so here we're, going up and then now we're looking into assets and then into images and then into otter.jpg. So that's just another way you can use relative path. We usually prefer relative paths to absolute paths just because um, if you like, I guess the reason why is because absolute paths, it might change. And so we don't want you to like face an issue later on where you're like, maybe you move a file 
like around and then the absolute path or sorry the absolute path wouldn't change but I think the relative path is more concise and so we would rather have you guys use relative paths and then an absolute path. So now moving on to the CSS portion of the lecture, which is more focused on the design aspect, whereas the HTML previously, it was mostly about the structure of your website. So we wanna break this down into four main concepts. Um, the initial one is files and linking CSS. So before you code anything in CSS, you wanna make sure that like the style sheet is correctly linked in your HTML file. Otherwise, if you don't correctly link it, none of your styles will show up on your page. So how does the HTML file know where to find its CSS? Well, inside the head tag, um, usually you have like title. Um, now we're gonna add another tag called link. And so link is gonna be referring to your style sheet and the syntax is just link rel equals style sheet, type equals text slash, text slash CSS, and then you put the file path inside the href um, attribute. So there's no need to memorize this. You can just like copy and paste this whenever you want to reference a style sheet, but make sure that your file path is correct. And moving on to the syntax of CSS. So it's pretty different from HTML um, in that it's less about like the, like you're not actually coding anything that'll show up on the website. It's just about modifying and adding styles to existing elements on your HTML page. So this is kind of the general format of what a CSS line of code would look like. So you have the HTML element, which is H1 here. So it's a header tag. And then within the curly braces, you have two attributes and their values. So the first one is color colon blue semicolon. Um, so that just tells you that you wanna change the heading text to a blue color. Um, so color is the CSS property and then blue is the property value. And make sure that at the end of each line for these property value pairs, you wanna put a semicolon, otherwise your file will not compile correctly. So, Here's kind of like a visual representation of how CSS is applied to your HTML page. So here you notice that in the head tag, we linked the style sheet. Um, and so that's referring to the style.css file that we have on the right side. And inside the style.css file, you can see that there's um, property and value pairs apply to both div tags and h1 tags. And so, Basically the style is applied or like the first style for div is applied to the div tag here. So you can see that it like, it's a very like logical like application of like um, the width and the background and the color is applied to like everything that's within this div tag. And then for the H1 tag, it's basically the same um, except it's because H1 is within div, it's applied just to the H1 tag. So this is just like how you can apply styles to different elements on a page, um, even when they're like nested within each other. So going more in depth um, about selectors. So basically selectors tells us what elements in the HTML we want to select or apply these CSS properties to. So like what you guys saw on the previous slide, we use the selector div to apply the font size and the color to the div element on the page. So that's basically like how selectors work in CSS. And there's a lot of different ways that you can select things on the page and we'll go more into detail about that later. And the next part of it is property and value. So the property defines what exactly we're changing about the selector element. So it could be like background, it could be color, font size, like margin, padding, et cetera. And then the value is specifying how we are changing it or what it could be changed to. So together, these property value pairs become a declaration or a rule. And so each rule, each of these rules that are within these curly braces is basically applied to the selected element, which is the div. And some other kind of like miscellaneous, very small things to notice is that 
Um, rules for a selector fall between curly braces. And I kind of already mentioned that. So yeah, that's just the general structure of how you include rules within um, the selector elements that you want to change. Um, and then again, make sure to remember that each rule is separated by a semicolon. Otherwise, the CSS wouldn't compile correctly and it wouldn't recognize that like this is a rule if you don't like end it after like 32 pixels. It would just like carry on to the next line and then CSS would be very confused. And then lastly, comments written in CSS is surrounded by um, slash asterisk. Um, and so this is just another way you can comment things out in your code. It's different from HTML where you use like um, angle bracket, exclamation mark, dash, dash. So next we'll move on to CSS selectors specifically. So for example, here on the left side, we have three different paragraph text um, indicated by three different like paragraph, like open and closing paragraph tags. And so what if we don't want all the tags to be the same style? So for example, as the text itself suggests, we want the first one to be green, the second one to be blue, and then the third one to be green again. So if we <clears throat> simply applied this style on the right side, where we like apply color green and then color blue again, obviously that in, like doesn't make any intuitive sense. And it would also not work um, in real life when you apply that to the paragraph tags. So what do we do in this case? We can make an attempt by designating the, the second paragraph tag to be a div tag instead of a paragraph. And in this way, we can like segment it so that only the paragraph tags are color green and then the div tags are color blue. However, this could run into a lot of problems in the future because maybe you want the blue text to be a paragraph and you don't want that to be a div. Um, and there's a lot of other ways you might like, run into problems like semantically, it might be confusing for you if you change everything to like a different um, like type of component. And also there's not that many types of components that you could change it to. So you wanna make sure that there's another way that you can differentiate all of these different tags. So basically that way is by using classes or IDs. So this is what you should do instead. You should assign classes and IDs to these elements so that you can refer them you can refer to them directly in the CSS. So the first one, we assign a class green. And on the right side, you can see that we specifically selected the class green in the CSS. So only paragraphs with class green will be colored green. On the other hand, we specify the second one to be an ID blue. So on the right side, you can see that we use hashtag blue to select that ID and color it blue. So this is a much more organized way you can separate elements um, on the page from each other when you're trying to apply styles to them. So going more in depth about the specific um, classes and ideas and how they work. So classes is you're applying a set of rules to multiple elements on the page. Um, and so here on the right, you can see that there's green text, green text two, and also green. And they all have the same class green. So when you're applying the class um, or when you're selecting the class green from the CSS, you're basically selecting all of these different P and div tags. And so it doesn't matter like if it's a paragraph or a div, as long as it's a class green, then it will be selected and it will be colored green. And yeah, I noticed someone asked in the chat about like the syntax. So classes, um, you denote them with a period in front of the class in the CSS when you're selecting it. So that's why you do dot green. Um, for IDs, it's hashtag green. So yeah, moving on to IDs, whereas classes is applying to like multiple components, IDs are used to apply a set of rules to only one distinct component on the page. So here we have a paragraph tag with an ID blue. And in the CSS, we specify hashtag blue is colored blue. So that selects um, that par individual paragraph tag that has an ID blue and it colors it blue. So someone asked, why would a div tag have text? Isn't it just to segregate sections of the page? So div tags can be used to hold text inside of it. Um, 
it can also be used to section like parts of your HTML page. So it can kind of do like both. Uh, why do, oh, do we have to have spaces? What do you mean by like spaces, like in the selector or? A little like curvy bracket and then like another line color blue. And then another. Oh, okay. So you mean like the line break between like the curly brackets and the color blue? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's just a way for us to like organize our code in a more readable fashion. Um, if you like put color blue and then like, for example, um, let me go to a previous slide. So like if you did font size 32 pixels and then color green on the same line, it would become really long, especially have, if you have like a lot of rules. And if you like condense it even more by putting it on the same line as the curly braces, it's just very hard to read. Um, so like usually when you're writing CSS, you want to like make it more organized and like space out like each rule so that you can like easily modify it later, yeah. And it doesn't affect it when there's like uh, yeah no it doesn't so like this is kind of like outside the scope of the class but like if you're working in the industry and you see some css files are like minimized that means like it's all condensed into like one line and so theoretically you could like write all of your css code in one line but of course for readability purposes that's not really good yeah yeah thank you so much mm -hmm. Yeah, so going back to where I was, I forgot. <laughs> okay, yeah, so for IDs, this is basically how it works. It's very similar to classes, except IDs is only applied to one element and you use the hashtag syntax. So it'd be a problem if you set ID to equal the blue from multiple different places. Like um, you would confuse it. Yeah, so like from my knowledge, like if you, have multiple paragraph tabs with the ID blue, it would still work. It's just semantically incorrect. Like it just wouldn't really make sense. So ideally you'd only have one tag that has an ID blue and you would apply the CSS to just that individual element. Does that like answer your question? Yeah, I think so. So it's more for readable readability purposes or? Just yeah. Or at least like from like my experience, like I have accidentally applied like ID styles to like multiple elements and like it works, but like it's, it's like doesn't make sense when you're like trying to like read the code. Yeah. Um, would it use the most recent blue or the earliest blue? So are you talking about like the like previous slide where we have like two different styles for the color or in classes? Yeah, um, like if we did it in CSS. Oh, you mean like if you applied both the class and the ID or like? Like, like if two classes had the same like ID. I guess the only difference sure. like it, it created it was originally intended to be for one element when CSS was made. Um, but like as tech got better, like browsers got smarter and they're just like, oh, okay, we might as well just apply it to all of them. So really the only difference is like, you don't need to know this, but there is a cascading hierarchy of uh, how styles get uh, used. So like ID is most top priority, then classes and then tags itself. Um, and that's why CSS is called cascading style sheets because there's a cascading uh, um, rule hierarchy where IDs are most priority and tag names at least. Um, so that's the only reason it's used, like there's a difference now, um, but that really wasn't the original intention of why they had classes or IDs. So like Arthur said, it's just really just a readability. Like we definitely recommend you to use it uh, like wisely where you have classes for certain things and then IDs for unique things. But again, if, if you don't follow that, it's like, it's not the end of the world. Yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, yeah, it gets like kind of complicated when you have like multiple classes and IDs together. So like browsers have like evolved to like process it in a like priority fashion. 
Yeah, so some final tips for remembering the differences between IDs and classes. So you can think of it as um, a student ID is unique per student. So like every student has an ID and it's a number and usually you present numbers as like hashtags. On the other hand, classes contain multiple students and many students take a class and classes are like periods <laughs> like that you take in high school. So you represent that with a period. Yeah, so this is just um, a way to like remember the fact that like an ID is a hashtag and a class is a period. So now we'll talk about selecting multiple elements. Um, so the way you do this in CSS is to separate each element with a comma. So here you can see that we selected one, two, and three. One and two are classes um, while three is an ID. And here we're selecting all of them at the same time. So we want to set lorem ipsum delor to font size 32 pixels. And we can do this just by putting commas in between each of the different selectors. On the other hand, maybe this is what you were asking about, Jason, I'm not exactly sure, but if you wanted to select an element with multiple names, this is how you would do it. So classes can have multiple names within one tag. Um, so here on the right side, you can see that the text alarm has two classes called green and big. And so you can select both of them at the same time by saying dot green dot big. And you wanna make sure that there's no space between these CSS selectors. So this is how you select like multiple classes at the same time. Um, so here, instead of applying to both of the tags, um, you'd only apply to the first one um, because you're only selecting green dot big together. You're not selecting dot green separately or dot big separately. So the CSS in this example will only apply to the first paragraph tag and not the second. Another way you can select elements is by selecting, selecting nested elements. So here it's um, denoted by a space between the selectors. So I can tell how I made this slide, but basically you have a div with an ID J and inside that div you have a paragraph tag uh, with the class park. And so, yeah, basically you have a paragraph nested within a div tag and you want to select the paragraph tag that's within that div tag. So this is basically how you do it. So you say hashtag J space dot park. And so you put a space in between the selectors and that tells CSS that you want to look inside the ID J and then further more look inside the class park. And so this would apply to just the paragraph tag and it would make the font size 32 pixels. Um, someone asked periods in CSS replace spaces in the HTML class. Um, do you mean like, oh, okay. So you're saying like if you translated from- Like, like in the previous slide, if you go back- one yeah. Time. So there's green big separated by a space. And mm -hmm. to reference that you do dot green dot big. Yeah, I guess you could think of it as like replacing it with a period, but I just think of it as like, for example, if you had another class like um, round or something, so like green big round, uh, the way you would select that element is by doing dot green dot big dot round. Yeah, so you could think of it as like you're replacing the space with a period, yeah. Because what if you have the class called green dot big? Like that's oh. the name of the class. Yeah, so I don't think you're allowed to have periods within class names. I think that would run into conflicts with like how you select in CSS, yeah. So you can like use hyphens in class names, but I don't think you can use periods. I think it would error, yeah. I see, okay, thank you, that makes sense. Okay, I'm like really slow at reading, so hopefully Howie can answer all your questions. <laughs> okay, moving on to pseudo selectors. So pseudo selectors are a little bit different. Um, it selects the element under a certain state and it's really good for implementing user interaction on your website. So um, for example, here we use hover 
So this style is only applied to the div tag when the cursor is hovered over the div text on the page. So the structure of a general pseudo selector goes by normal selector, which is like the tag slash class slash ID you want to select. And then you use colon pseudo class to specify that you want to select this element when it's in a certain state. So yeah, as I described, like when you hover over the div tag, you want to change the font size and the color. And this is only applied when it's hovered. So when it's not hovered, you don't apply this style at all. Some other pseudo classes or pseudo selectors that you can use is visited and active. So visited is when a link has been visited before. So you might notice like when you're navigating through like websites that like a link is purple instead of blue. And that means that you have visited the link before. And so you can like style that visited pseudo selector to be like a different style, like rather than just purple, which is the default in most browsers. And then there's also active, which is um, a state that occurs when the mouse is currently clicked on an element. So this is really useful when you're trying to style like buttons or links. Um, yeah, I think those are the main two elements that you would use for active. And there's also a lot more pseudo classes and you can probably just search them up um, and like find out what they are. For example, like I know focus is what happens when your cursor is clicked inside a text field and you might see that there's like a blue like hovering effect or like a blue borderline effect that shows up when you're like focused in an input field. And so that's another pseudo class example. But yeah, there's a lot of them out there. So kind of summarizing everything that we've talked about so far. So CSS is used to change the default appearance of HTML. And it usually goes in a separate file, um, most commonly named style.css. When you have like a bigger repository, you might name these files like differently to, I guess, make it easier for you to like, I guess, segment your styles into a more organized way. But usually in this class, you just put all of them into style.css. And the way we reference the style sheet within our HTML file is by using this line right here, which says link rel style sheet type equals text CSS. And then you provide the correct file path for that style sheet. And remember, there's like many ways to do that. So you can use relative path or you can use absolute path. And in terms of the syntax for CSS, it looks like this. So you have the selector, um, for the element on the page. And then you have curly braces to indicate that these are the rules that you want to apply. And each line represents a rule which consists of a property and a value. And you wanna make sure that each rule is ended with a semicolon. So going over the specific selectors that we talked about, one, you can apply the CSS to a specific HTML tag. And so this is how you do it by selecting, for example, H1. The second way is to apply it to a class of elements. And you'd use that with, uh, or you'd use that by selecting with a period. The third way is to select using a specific element and you'd use the ID for that. And that is denoted by a hashtag. And then lastly, you can, there's like a lot of ways you can select multiple themes on the page. So you can use that by doing commas in between the different selectors. For pseudo selectors, um, there's a lot of ways you can style, for example, links. Uh, link is really, I guess, interactive by nature. So there's a lot of pseudo selectors that can be applied to it. So the first one um, is just like a default link style. The second one is um, what happens when a cursor is hovered over the link. And so you want to apply a certain color or text decoration. Um, yeah, so that's one way you can change the link when you hover over it. Another one is what happens when you currently click on the link. And so you use that uh, with active. Um, so that basically says that when you click on the link, it becomes active and you wanna change the background to light gray. And then the last one is what happens when you have visited it before, which by default is a purple color and you might wanna change that as well. So you'd use visited as the pseudo selector. Yeah, so this is kind of a summary of some, I guess, possible rules that you can apply to change how a text 
or div appears on your page. So the first one is, I guess, changing how the text appears. And you can do this through color, font size, font family, text inspiration, et cetera. And so that's usually applied to text. So that's like paragraph tags or even div tags or h1 tags. And then the second one is changing size and spacing. This is usually for like blocks on your page. So this could also be applied to div tags, um, but this is I think more applicable for like images or um, specific like shapes that you might have on your page that you might wanna change like the size and spacing of. And then last but not least, we have just some other extra styles that you can apply such as background color, border and border radius. And you'll see like throughout the course of the semester, there's a lot of other styles you can apply to and we'll go more into depth about them as well. Yeah, so just to provide you guys an overview of what the spacing styles might look like. So this is what you might see um, if you use inspect element on a page and you look at a specific like div tag or like a box and you see that there's like a breakdown of these, I guess, four levels um, that you could like, I guess, decompose the box into. So when you have like the margin on the outside and then you have like the border and then within the border you have padding and then within padding you have the actual content. So we'll go more in depth about the spacing, like I guess box hierarchy within the design lecture, but we just wanna kind of give you guys an overview of what this looks like. A note on colors. Um, so throughout these slides, we've only used like very basic convenient colors, such as blue, green, light blue, beige, et cetera. Um, and these are kind of like default values that the browser has that you can use just by like using the name itself, like blue. Um, but if you want a more specific color, you want to use the hex code. And so hex code is usually written with six digits preceded by a hashtag symbol. So for example, the WDD green color that we use is hashtag 75C36E. And we showed on the right side that this is kind of the shade that it looks like. Um, so if you Google search like color picker, it will automatically pop up this like very convenient color picker tool that you can use to just like try out different hex values and see what the shades look like. So now we'll move on to a demo to kind of apply everything that we've seen so far. So let's go to this link, wdd.io slash go slash html css dash demo. So I'm gonna stop sharing screen and go to that. Okay, so here we have a JS bin with some instructions as to like how exactly we want to change up the styling of this page. So on the right side, you can see that there's the output. So as soon as we make like any changes to these files, the output will automatically refresh with the things that you've added to the code. So here in the CSS file, you might see that there's some instructions. So let's just like walk through each of them. So let me expand this so you guys can read the whole entire thing. Yeah, I'm not sure why the text isn't wrapping here, but I guess hopefully this is more readable. Um, okay. So let's start by looking at the HTML file on the left side. So we have an H1 tag with the name Susan Chan inside of it. And then we have an image below, which is not showing up, <laughs> unfortunately, um, but let's just ignore that. Um, so we have here a paragraph tag, and then we have an, or sorry, an unordered list. And within that list, we have bullet points for these different like foods. Okay. Also, Susan Chen is a former TA. <laughs> That's why her name is here. Um, yeah, okay. So starting with H1, we want to change the font size to 36 PT and margin bottom zero pixels. So does anyone want to like 
give it a try and like maybe like type in the chat or like say out loud what exactly they would code in the CSS for this. Yeah, so Hannah said H1, <laughs> that's the first line, yes. So <laughs> yeah, sorry, Zoom chat is like weird like that. Um, but yeah, we, sh we would start with H1 and then the curly braces and it automatically gives us an, uh, like a closing brace for that, which is really convenient. So we don't mess up our syntax. So yeah, the first thing we wanna do is select the element with the tag name. So here we select it by saying H1. And then inside the curly braces, we want to apply the actual rules. Um, this is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm just gonna do it myself. Yeah, so you might see that it's already changing on the right side. So previously the H1, um, if I delete this, it's a smaller font, but now after applying this, we can see that it has changed. Okay. Um, next, we wanna do the paragraph tag. So again, similar to what we did before with the H1, we want to declare the selector. And then inside the curly braces, we want to specify that it's a certain font size and we wanna change the line height. So yeah, you can see that the spaces between each line of the paragraph has increased because we changed the line height to 1.5. Next, we want to select an image, or so, sorry, select the image with an ID profile. Um, and so this is the chance for us to use an ID selector. Yeah, so unfortunately this picture does not show up. Um, maybe I'll find another picture just to show you guys. Let's just go with the cat. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna copy the image address and paste it in. So hopefully it shows up. Oh. Okay, yay, we have a cat now. Okay, so we want to basically make this image a circle instead of like a rectangle shape as we see right now. So first we want to select this with hashtag profile. Actually, sorry, first thing we need to do is actually assign the ID to the image tag. So we wanna say here in the HTML, ID is profile. Yeah, okay. And then within the CSS now, we can apply the style that we want to apply to the image. So in order to make it a circle, one way you could do it is by using border radius. So, I'm going to specify the border radius is 50%. So yeah, this is not quite a circle just because the image itself is a rectangle shape, but if the image was like a shape, then this would be a perfect circle. But I think this is fine for now. And then lastly, um, this is kind of more advanced because it involves like using transform, which is something that you'd use to implement CSS animations. But the fourth one is asking us to use the ID and change it when it's hovered on. So we can do hashtag profile and then use the pseudo selector hover. And so whatever style we put inside these curly braces will be applied when the picture is hovered on. Um, yeah, so it wants us to rotate it 360 degrees. Um, if I can scroll <laughs> to see what the rest of this says. Oh, okay, yeah, so transform and transition. So transition kind of tells you like how long, or it specifies, yeah, how long it takes for you to like go through the animation. 
and then transform tells you what you want to do with the animation, like how you want to transform it basically. Um, so I believe the syntax for this would be like transform rotate. <laughs> I'm like a little rusty on this. So you would specify that you want to rotate by 360 degrees and then transition, let's say one second. Okay, it's not working. <laughs> I think I did the transform wrong. Um, I think you need 360 DAG, the unit. Oh, okay. 360 DAG, yeah. Yay, <laughs> it rotates, okay. Yeah, so this is something that we'll cover later on when we talk about CSS animations. But for now, um, just worry about like the pseudo structure here, which is hover. Yeah, so you can see that it only happens when I hover over the image. Yeah. Are there any questions about this demo? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. On the HTML side, where it says see more pictures on and then like a bracket, for that one, how come like there's, you don't have to put like a bracket in front of the see more pictures? See more pictures? Oh, yeah. um, this is HTML. So are you talking about like a, like a paragraph tag or something? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so by default, like you can not nest text within paragraph tags and it will still show, it will still like show up fine. Um, but if you want to like organize it better or like apply a certain style to it, then you need to like surround it in a certain tag. Oh, but okay. like you can just like leave it as is and it'll still show up as like normal text. Yeah. So for the bottom P, like if there wasn't a bracket P, it would still show up? Um, you mean this one, right? Mm -hmm. It will still show up. It's just the fact that like the style won't be applied anymore. So like you see that like the line height has changed. Mm -hmm. So if you want to like, I guess, manipulate it with a style, you have to make sure that it's within a tag so you can like select it in the CSS. Okay. Yeah. I think we're short on time. So yeah, if there's no other questions, then I'll end the lecture here for the programming section. Okay, for some reason I wasn't able to share my screen. So that was great. But yeah, so um, since Julia just went over um, all of the CSS, now we can start applying some more design principles to whatever we're trying to CSS. So today we'll be going over visual hierarchy through spacing. And yeah, let's get into it. So this can be kind of broken down into the importance of spacing. And then we'll go into like a little bit more detail about um, the different types of spacing that there is. So um, first of all, let's take a look at these really lovely user interfaces that we have. So um, does anyone want to like drop in chat or you can just say it out loud? What is wrong with this amazing tech catalog that we see here? <laughs> Everything. Yeah, honestly, you're not far off. Like there's a lot going on here. Yeah, Emily says it looks pretty. I don't know about that one. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um. But yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, yeah, Peter says it's too congested, which is exactly the problem here. There's like a lot of stuff happening. And when you immediately look at it, the user is definitely overwhelmed and like you don't even know where to look. And there's also a lot of colors, a lot of images, a lot of different font sizes, but we'll go into a lot of like the more technical details later. But yeah, just we just know that there's a lot um, going on. What about this one? It was like a pop up that download a virus. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, so similarly, um, this one's also like, this one also has a lot going on. Um, the you have died window isn't even centered. You can't like even see the screen. Of course you died. Um, there are a lot of windows open. I don't know what these are. Not that I game or anything. So I probably am more confused than the average person, but. Yeah, yes, this is World of War Warcraft, I think. But yeah, basically the UI is cluttered. And um, when the UI is cluttered, 
there's a lot of things that can like go wrong. The user doesn't know where to look like I mentioned before or like what you're supposed to be looking at. And so when you clutter your interface, you overload your user with too much information. And so what we should be doing is reducing the clutter to improve like comprehension. And so, um, yeah. So our users um, won't see that much content because there's too much going on. And so we really need to consider that like the information that we have on a page is clear and really what we want the user to look, look at. So the goal of the page is always for the user to know what the real focus is. And so in that sense, quality always matters a lot more than quantity. And yeah, um, the user's time is really precious, you know, especially with people's decreasing attention spans. Like I can barely look at a TikTok if it's more than like 30 seconds. So how can you expect your average user to really like put in the effort to look at whatever you're reading and so, or whatever you're trying to get them to read. And so the amount of time people spend interacting with something is really like really valuable. And that's essentially the essence of what user experience is. And so we need like white space to like calm us down and let us breathe and not to like flex our slides or anything, but there's enough space. There's like white space on this slide to really let us like focus on the main content of um, the slide, which is like the sentence right here. And yeah, so that leads us to like our main focus of today, which is visual hierarchy and just creating a hierarchy of information. And yeah, so just going into like a little bit more terminology. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, there's like negative space, which is kind of like the empty space and space between positive space. So positive space is stuff like this title right here. Um, we also have some positive space um, here and like right here. And then the negative space on this page is the space between our title and the paragraph text. And so this space is a little bit bigger than this space because we do want to distinguish our title from our paragraph text. And then we also have two different situations going on here, which is why we also split it up here. And then our paragraphs kind of have less space because they're all um, related information. So yeah, it just allows us to create a little bit more emphasis between, oh yeah, you're good, Howie, <laughs> um, emphasis between the slides. And so positive and negative space isn't only seen um, on like digital pages and like websites and stuff. You can also really see this in real life as well and in architecture. So this is a photo of an Apple store. It's a really nice Apple store. I'm not really sure where it is, but it seems like London maybe based on that double decker bus back there. But um, yeah, you can like see the focus on the products in the Apple store because it's right in the center of the room. So that's kind of like our positive space. And then we also have gaps between the table, which is our negative space to really like let the flow of the room breathe. Um, I'm not an architecture major, but you know, it's the design principles are essentially the same as in like digital interfaces. And so, yeah, it's just really cool to see that um, reflect in real life as well. Yeah, so now if we look at like the Google website, you can also see the idea of like positive and negative space playing out here. So here we have like a lot of negative space. And I know like, I think Google went through like a design situation where people were like, oh, it's really confusing that there's so much negative space because I always feel like I'm waiting for something to load. But you know, since Google is essentially just a search, like their main focus used to be just um, being like a search browser um, and like a search engine for people. So obviously the search is right in the middle and everything else is just negative space because they do want to put the spotlight on the positive space. And then we have some like extra stuff up here. So that's also positive space, um, but that's like, you know, peripheral to the main focus, which is the search engine. And so basically what it boils down to is more white space means more emphasis. And so um, less white space isn't necessarily bad. It just means that we're asking the user to focus less on whatever content has less emphasis. Um, yeah. And then, so if we take a look at like this, like um, this comparison between paragraph text, we can see that um, less spacing makes the text a little bit less readable. And then as opposed to um, this, which has a lot more spacing in between the lines, um, it's a lot more readable. So, um, 
this is honestly why teachers ask for double spaced essays. And yeah, it just makes it easier to read. Um, it lets you like really focus on the content at hand. And yeah, just keep that in mind when you're adding paragraph text to your website. Cool. And then so now that we're kind of going um, into the difference between adding space between elements and space within elements. And so there's that distinction in macro and micro level spacing where macro level spacing is the space between elements of the page. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more of this later, but um, while micro level spacing is like the previous slide where the spacing is between the, like within each of the elements. So if you have a paragraph text, that's the space between the lines. So that's micro level spacing. So if we take a look at the Stripe website, um, this is a pretty outdated um, screenshot of the Stripe website. It looks a lot like more modern now, but not to say that this isn't bad or anything. Um, we can definitely see how macro and micro level spacing plays out here. So macro level spacing here, um, you can kind of see the pa different page sections being split up between um, like the website. So here we have the navigation and then we have some um, spacing here to split it up from the landing text and then some more spacing to split it up from the hero image and just like the rest of the page as well. And we also have some margins here to just like center everything and just put the user's focus directly on what matters, which is, you know, their call to action right here. And then now if we take a look even closer at their call to action and stuff, we can see even more spacing being played, um, being like, yeah, in play. And then so we can see some spacing here in the between the header and some of like their um, extraneous information and especially between the text and their description and their call to action buttons, which is like whatever they're trying to like drive their users to be like clicking. Um, all of that is definitely focused based like with this spacing here. Yeah, so um, earlier in um, the programming lecture, Julia talked about like margin and padding. So just to, to like reiterate this from like a design standpoint, um, padding definitely helps make the make the element feel a little bit more breathable. And so that's what the spacing is kind of here for. And then margin is spacing between the elements. So if you have multiple buttons or just multiple elements of like other things in a line, um, it just gives it a little bit more of a buffer so that it doesn't feel like all of your elements are crammed together. Cool. And yeah, uh, um, we're going back to the box model image. And so, um, yeah, from like a CSS standpoint, here we have like our content and then we have our padding just like um, separating it from the border. So this is um, essentially our uh, like element that we're styling. And then this, the content here is usually like your image or your text. And then so this padding is creating space between the edge of your um, element and whatever's inside your element while margin is creating space between your element and other elements that you have on your page. So yeah, all just very good things to know for spacing. And then um, when we also think about like creating space on our page, we also definitely wanna consider the line width. So when you're creating like paragraphs, the narrower the paragraph, the easier it is to read. Um, obviously there's like a minimum like narrowness that you should be, um, you know, creating you shouldn't have like a one word per line type of thing going on but basically the idea behind this is that the less like horizontal movement your eye has to make the easier it is to read because um your eyeballs just have to move less you know so yeah you can use a div to restrict width of the text and then like julia mentioned in the previous lecture you can um, apply a class or an id to this div and then just set width in css so here's an example. Um, this is a Medium website. For those of you who don't know, Medium is kind of like a blog posting website um, where people just write stuff and just put it online. So obviously, because it's a blog post website, you want the blog post to be as readable as possible. So that's why there's so much white space here um, so that you kind of like constrict the text into a certain width and the user's eyes don't have to like move left to right as much. And so here we have like an example, like kind of a comparison between width 100% and um, constraining the width. So here we have a 100% width type of situation. 
and not gonna lie like I'm my eyes are a bit like stressed out like I don't want to really read this and it's also a little bit overwhelming for the user because um it's a lot more tiring to retain information when it's so wide and it kind of makes me anxious having to read to the end of the page and so how we can fix this is adding um a constraint to the width and now it feels a lot better and even though it's the same amount of text it definitely like feels a lot more breathable and more approachable for the reader to actually read. Yeah, so now when we like think about like metrics from a um, CSS standpoint, again, we definitely want to make sure that the margins and the padding around a certain element is like consistent. Um, obviously there, this can be like seen on like a case by case basis, um, but for the most part, we want all of the padding and margins to be equal. Otherwise it just like looks uneven when you have it on your page. Cool. And so, yeah, there's definitely also a balance though between um, creating space and like having too much space. So here is an overuse of spacing. Here's the CS61B website, like for the data structures class from fall 2015. And this is just, um, it just seems like a list of information, right? Like there's nothing necessarily like wrong with it like all the information is there and accessible but <laughs> shots fired um but it's just hard to like navigate in terms of like organization of information so if we go to the next slide it's a little bit of bigger picture um oh yeah oh oh no <laughs> but yeah so here um if we like grouped together certain um chunks of information it would definitely be a lot easier for people and students to just navigate. So maybe we could have like the logistics in one chunk and then a bigger space and then have like, like I don't know, documentation and resources in another chunk and then assignments in another chunk. So like just by blocking stuff out like that, it makes the website a lot more approachable and just better a better user experience for the user. So here's what it looks like now, spring 2021. Um, yeah, information is organized a lot better and it's just a lot more approachable. So that's that. And yeah, so just avoid the barren. Um, when you do use spacing, make sure you're thinking about the spacing that you're adding. Don't just like add it everywhere because otherwise you're gonna get a full 2015 CDS 61B type of, type of situation going on. So yeah, when we talk about like create, creating rhythmic structure, um, what this means is, so like going back to our nice Stripe website, we're just um, making the structure a little bit more predictable for the user. So here um, we're like increasing it gradually and then we're also keeping it consistent with like this. So here we have like a smaller like landing area and as you scroll down it increases and you scroll down a little bit more, it's not going to drastically decrease to like a small div again you have like a pretty similar situation going on to like here. So any transition that you have, it's a little bit more gradual and it's the user can expect what's what they're going to be able to see. Cool. And then as for like symmetry and stuff, here's a screenshot of um, Aja's Instagram. So go ahead and follow her art Instagram if you um, aren't. Um, but yeah, so Instagram follows like a very, symmetrical approach to laying out their information and the reason for this is because like all of their posts ideally should be like you know regarded the same with the same um like importance so here all of the posts are like you know the same size and it just makes it a lot more like it creates balance and then you also the user can kind of expect what kind of content to see and then when we take a look at um asymmetric designs you kind of see like a hierarchical structure of information here and so here like the user's eyes are automatically drawn to this adobe like image and then the other ones are kind of like on the sidelines because this one's so big and so it's really up to you when you're creating your website like what you want the user to focus on if you want all of the information to be presented equally then you would take a similar approach to instagrams um and if you want to highlight something, then you could take like this approach where you kind of highlight one thing in particular. 
cool. So yeah, that's pretty much um, the end, but just like some things to note, we know we like covered a lot of information. So we will post our cheat sheets for general topics in this class because there's a lot of like stuff to like remember for HTML and CSS. And so, yeah, just check Piazza for when, when we release them. And so if you're in, interested in spacing and stuff, you can definitely check out the Medium article that we linked on the slides. Um, it's pretty interesting. And then next Thursday, we're going to start covering Figma. And so Figma is like our prototyping tool and like our tool that we use to like create like mockups and like high fidelity stuff. So yeah, make sure to have that downloaded for next Thursday um, or just make an account, honestly. Like I don't think I have Figma on my computer, but yeah, we'll make a more detailed post for that later. And then, yeah, as usual, just fill out our anonymous feedback form. We definitely check it very regularly. So yeah, that's it. Do we have any questions? I had a quick question about one of the slides. Mm -hmm. um, there was something about like gestalt principles should determine spacing. So I was wondering what that is. Yeah, um, I'm not like super like, like um, knowledgeable about it, but I do know that it refers to like the idea that people have, um, it's like a psychological principle that people tend to group things by different. Um, so that's like the, the idea of like, overuse of spacing and how people are able to group information together. And so that's kind of like the principle behind it. I see that. But yeah, it was like made in like the 1920s, some um, psychological idea about um, design principles. Oh, I see, that makes sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if there's no other questions, um, we're pretty much done for today. Um, yeah, we'll release home or homework has been released. And so yeah, make sure to get in homework one on time. And yeah, we're all good. <laughs>